What actually are whistleblowers? How important are they for the aviation industry? And why is it that Boeing and their partners seem to have so many of them lately? Well, we definitely live in a world where whistleblowers are becoming more and more important, even though there seem to become fewer and fewer of them. Stay tuned. Wise people disagree about exactly when or where the term whistleblower was actually invented. A lot of different sports feature a referee who often uses a whistle to stop play when someone does something that they shouldn't or when the score changes. And for over a century, police have also used whistles to get the attention of the public or of other policemen about something worth paying attention to. But in those roles, the whistleblower is generally used to address a problem or danger from someone else. They don't whistle to warn others about themselves, except, I guess, maybe train drivers who use huge whistles to warn people to get off the tracks. And I guess, actually, they might be the original whistleblowers. In any case, in the 1960s, the term whistleblower started to be used in the meaning that we understand today. Someone who alerts others about an activity or a problem that they are unhappy with for legal, moral or other reasons, and which is, in their view, not being handled properly by their organization. Now, that is a very broad definition, I know, and it can be applied just as widely. Over the years, whistleblowers have emerged in both public and private organizations and businesses, and even in the military forces of a lot of countries. Of course, laws with some basic provisions for whistleblowers and whistleblower protections have existed long before the term itself actually became popular back in the 1960s, but for the most part, those early laws were too weak and easy to get around. In fact, Laws that specifically aim to protect whistleblowers are surprisingly recent. In the United States, the Whistleblower Protection Act became law in 1989, and in the UK, the Public Interest Disclosure Act was ratified in 1998, with some improved amendments being added during the years that followed. Now, the EU was even later to the game. While some of the member countries had some relevant laws, the first comprehensive EU-wide whistleblower law came into effect as late as in 2019. Today, there are very detailed regulations on whistleblowing and a lot of books with rules and best practices on how to do it. But because this is such a generic topic, a lot of resources, especially legal ones, concentrate on whistleblowing for things like intellectual property disputes between different companies finance, trade, and other similar stuff. But of course, in aviation, the thing that we are mainly interested in here is whistleblowing over safety concern. And that is relevant to other industrial and manufacturing industries as well. And while aviation is perhaps more critical than most, the biggest ever historical whistleblowing stories include things like chemical spills in rivers or even improper storage of spent fuel from nuclear power plants. Now, at this point, I should mention that most of the work that whistleblowers do remains out of the public eye, simply because it stays internal to the companies themselves. Companies and other organizations have procedures and communication channels that employees can use if they feel that something isn't handled appropriately. Or, I should say, companies should have those kind of procedures available. If they do, and if the employees feel confident that they can use them, well then whistleblowing to entities outside of the company, which is what we generally think of when we hear this term, shouldn't actually be necessary. So therefore, blowing the whistle in public on serious company problems should, in a well-functioning company, be the last solution. And that's worth remembering. In fact, there are even instances where whistleblower legislation actually requires the employee to have made at least some effort to resolve the problem from within the organization before going outside with the complaints. Now, I will get back to that particular bit a little bit later. But in many cases, though, even though the people have tried to go above their boss but still stayed within the company, this has opened those whistleblowers up for retaliation. Of course, legislation on whistleblower protection is supposed to protect them from exactly that, but in the real world, retaliation and reprisals can come in various ways that aren't always as obvious as withheld promotions, demotions, or even being fired. In some cases, for example, companies have tried to force whistleblowers to quit by handling them too much work and then following that up with negative performance reviews when they end up struggling. 
And proving that those type of retaliatory actions is happening is often really, really difficult to do. And sometimes there isn't even a need for that, because the whistleblowers will suffer from the stigma of being that guy in the eyes of colleagues and management anyway. There are a lot of stories out there about how colleagues who weren't even involved in the highlighted issues would often stay clear of the whistleblowers out of fear of getting into trouble or out of some sort of misguided us versus them sensation. And because of that, a lot of whistleblowers who find themselves in these kind of conditions feel like they have to quit. And in many cases, they might struggle to then find employment again in the same industry after they do. So becoming a whistleblower is, in my view, a true sign of courage and a strong character. And with that in mind, let's have a look at what some whistleblowers have been saying about Boeing and their suppliers and how these stories relate to other reports on Boeing and its culture. After this. Have you ever wondered how whistleblowers can uncover critical issues in big companies like Boeing? Well, it often comes down to analyzing data and spotting trends that others might otherwise miss. And when we're on the topic of working with real-world data, I am so happy to have my friends on Brilliant back as sponsors of this video. Brilliant is my go-to learning platform, and it's perfect for anyone looking to build their skills in areas like data analysis, maths, programming, and AI. The reason I really love them is because they really help you evolve your critical thinking and each of the lessons are crafted by award-winning teams from places like MIT, Duke and even Microsoft and Google, making you not just learn but think better. Right now I am super into Brilliant's brand new data courses, which is helping me to level up my understanding of parsing and visualizing massive data sets to make them easier to understand. But if that's not your cup of tea, well, and Brilliant also have courses in tech, science, physics, and basically anything STEM related. And because the platform adapts to your level, both me and my kids can actually use it. So to start getting a little bit smarter every day, use the link here below, which is brilliant.org slash mentor now, or scan this QR code. That will give you 30 days of free access to everything that Brilliant has to offer and 20% off an annual membership. Thank you, Brilliant. Now let's continue. Perhaps the best-known Boeing whistleblower is John Barnett, who was found dead from a gunshot wound in his truck in March this year in Charleston, South Carolina. The Charleston County coroner described his wound as self-inflicted, but the police are still investigating this tragedy. In the United States, if a whistleblower would want to report a problem with an aircraft manufacturer to authorities outside of the company, they would have to turn to the FAA. And that's exactly what Barnett eventually did after years of trying to report various problems internally. Bonat had worked at Boeing for 32 years, and he had spent the last seven of those from 2010 to 2017 working at the North Charleston, South Carolina facility. In there, Boeing was at the time making large 787 aerostructures and also assembling the 787-10, which is the largest 787 variant. Barnett had, during his years there, seen a number of things which concerned him regarding aspects of the 787 production. Firstly, he didn't like something called the Multifunction Process Performer, or the MFPP program. This process basically allowed Boeing technicians to inspect and approve their own work instead of getting a quality inspector in to sign it off for them. Barnett objected to this MFPP program, and he wasn't the only person in a quality control capacity at the site who did so. Several other people also had concerns about it. Barnett also stated that he had complained about parts being moved from one aircraft to another without documentation, and that titanium metal shavings as big as 3 inches in length were routinely being left inside of the center fuselage, among the wire bundles. Now, every time he complained to his superiors about these problems in one area of the factory, Barnett would then be moved to another part, he said. On one occasion, he was also admonished for emailing superiors about some problems instead of telling them face to face, which he took to mean that they didn't want these things to be recorded in writing. Barnett was even demoted once when he was moved, which he then filed an internal ethics complaint about and he was then reinstated. Eventually, Barnett chose to quit his job in 2017 after Boeing refused to transfer him to a different facility, a claim that Boeing didn't contest. The same year that he left, the FAA investigated the North Charleston facility for a number of these issues, reported by multiple Boeing employees, including those metal shavings that Barnett had found in 787 fuselages near electrical equipment. 
After that investigation, the FAA confirmed that 53 non-conforming parts in the factory were missing, with Barnett alleging that some of them had been fitted to actual aircraft. Barnett then filed a complaint against Boeing under the AIR-21, which is FAA's whistleblower protection program, claiming that he had been forced to quit his job because of the company's retaliatory actions. Now, that complaint was rejected in 2021, but Burnett then amended the lawsuit and the process continued. And at the time of his death, he was expected to go to court in order to continue pursuing that case. Now, I'm sure that you know that there's been a lot of speculation about the circumstances around Burnett's death in various media. I really don't want to comment on that, except to say that Burnett was just one of many Boeing employees who had made these and other claims about that Boeing facility publicly. In particular, the metal shavings and other FOD items, including forgotten tools and even a stepladder forgotten inside of a horizontal stabilizer, were frequent complaints at the Boeing site at the time. Even the US Air Force had officially complained about tools, rags and other forgotten items found inside of the KC-46 tankers, which by the way had not even been built at that North Charleston site. Now, a lot of these complaints and reports are eerily similar to the statements made by a group of three other whistleblowers working for Spirit Aero Systems in Wichita, Kansas, where, among other things, the Boeing 737 body is being made. One of those whistleblowers, Joshua Dean, also sadly passed away recently after a two-week battle in hospital with a sudden bacterial infection. You might remember that I made a video about Boeing's culture crisis and problems as Spirit, not too long ago, and in that video I pointed to a lawsuit brought against Spirit based on the testimonies of those three whistleblowers. Now, I didn't mention him by name in that video, but one of those whistleblowers was Joshua Dean, and he was the only person whose name was actually visible in the lawsuit document. The other two witnesses were anonymous at the time, although one of them, Santiago Paredes, has come forward since then. Now, as I explained in that video, Joshua Dean had discovered that many Boeing 737 fuselages had issues with misdrilled holes in the rear pressure bulkheads. When he noticed that, he notified several of his superiors, both verbally and in writing, but not only did Spirit ignore these pleas, they also didn't tell anyone, including their customer Boeing. Now, Boeing did eventually discover the problems without Spirit's input, and Spirit's then CEO, Tom Gental III, then admitted in an interview that the company had known all about this issue and that they had been trying to find a solution when Boeing eventually found out anyway. Now, not surprisingly, Gentile lost his job about three weeks after making that admission. As I explained in that video, all three of these employees eventually left Spirit. Dean was fired after being blamed for not spotting the other Spirit 737 defect, an issue with the attached fittings of the vertical stabilizer. He felt that he was made a scapegoat for this and argued that he had no time to investigate any issues with the vertical stabilizer since he had been given a completely unrealistic deadline to report a you know, on that pressure bulkhead issue before being moved to a different role, which is very similar to those kind of subtle pressures that I talked about before. The other two spirit whistleblowers had told stories of metal shavings left in the 737 fuselages, along with forgotten tools, rags and rivets, plus the fact that some workers were using miscalibrated torque wrenches when they were working on the fuselages. The class action lawsuit that these testimonies form part of paints a picture of Spirit as a company that put delivery schedules ahead of quality control. Just as a lot of experienced employees retired en masse and new hires fumbled their way through a very busy schedule. Now that's not a good look for sure, but as I mentioned earlier, it's a description that shared many similarities to what Boeing employees described in North Charleston. Spirit's Santiago Paredes said in an interview that he often found as many as 200 defects on parts that were supposedly ready for shipping over to Boeing, and incredibly, it also seems like Spirit's management tried to force him and his colleagues to change their reporting practices so that the number of reported faults would go down without the actual fault numbers changing. I'm finding over 100 defects in, in, in every day. Now, instead of rewarding Paredes for doing this, literally what he was paid to do as a quality inspector, other workers at Spirit apparently started calling him showstopper for slowing down the production and basically admonished him for finding other people's mistakes. And this just shows how hard a position like this can be, especially in an organization where the quality management and SMS is starting to slip a bit. In my view, this just makes the work that these three men did even more admirable. 
A bit more recently, another whistleblower called Sam Salepour has started presenting some different claims. In the case of the 787, his claims involve the composite sections of the fuselage and the way that they were being joined together using manual pressure to make the gaps between the different sections smaller in size. Now in this case, Boeing were actually quick to respond to Salipor's claims. And to be fair here, it should be said that the 787 was actually grounded for almost two years, between 2020 and 22, for essentially exactly that gap between fuselage section issue. This means that the FAA should already be aware of it, as well as the steps that Boeing has already taken to fix it. So I'm not sure that there is much news coming from that. Obviously though, this sad laundry list of pointed fingers is beyond embarrassing for Boeing, with accusations flying in from all kinds of directions. But I should also point out here that one of the most informative whistleblowers that we have heard from in recent months is someone who have gotten very little attention, probably because he or she has remained anonymous. On the 15th of January, less than 10 days after the Alaska Max blowout, Liam News wrote an article about it. In that article, they talked about the possibility that the door plug of the involved 737 MAX 9 had been opened or removed during an undocumented process at Boeing. Something that, by the way, turned out to be completely on the money. But crucially, a reader then commented under the article, basically explaining how this whole thing had happened in detail. He or she outlined the fact that Boeing had two recorded systems for faults, one that was the FAA mandated one and one informal discussion group similar to Slack and that the whole thing could be read about in there. Now, I made a video over on the Mentor Pilot channel looking at all of these things in detail along with facts about the incident stated in NTSB's interim report. But the reason I am mentioning this in particular is that a lot of whistleblowing usually actually takes this form. Someone anonymously gives the world just enough information to enable the investigators and authorities to fill in the gaps properly. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people have chosen to concentrate on the depth of these two brave whistleblowers instead of on the really important facts that they brought forward, creating all kinds of conspiracy theories. And even though I understand the human tendency to do that, I think the frustration that the awesome journalist Dominic Gates showed in social media after he broke the story about the death of Joshua Dean really says it all. And by the way, Joshua Dean actually got a job with Boeing after Spirit had fired him. So to summarize, the real point I want to make with this video is actually two. To start with, whistleblowers are heroes that put their own careers at risk for the greater good. And secondly, that whistleblowing, and in particular going outside of the company to blow the whistle, should in a perfect world be the very last step that an employee can take when something isn't right inside of the company that they work for. And that brings us back to Boeing's safety culture. I recently looked at Dr. Reeson's five necessary elements for an active, effective safety culture. At the most basic level, these are the mechanisms that allows a company's management to look for problems and allows its employees to speak up so that any problem that they find can be properly addressed. The reason I bring in this up is that if an organization actually has this system in place, there should be little to no reason for someone to feel the need to go outside of the organization whenever something just doesn't look right. So, if an organization actively collects and analyzes safety-related data and its management has built an environment where everyone is confident that they can report safety issues without retribution and the company has what it needs to learn from the mistakes that its people sees and report and employees know that they won't be punished for honest human mistakes, then and only then will the company be flexible enough to learn from these mistakes and recognize the need to change and adapt when it's necessary to do so. If not, it won't. Now with the kind of hostile attitudes that has existed between Boeing and many of their employees, it might be tempting to see this issue as a matter of missing loyalty, but that would be completely wrong. Whistleblowing exists not because people aren't loyal, but actually because they are. It happens when they see a problem which they would love to fix but that they can't find an existing working way of doing without blowing the whistle. And this is particularly true for whistleblowers who are still part of the company when they go public. When an FAA appointed panel of experts published their report of Boeing's safety management processes earlier this year, there were reports that Boeing's people treated the process as an audit and even got prepped by lawyers before their interviews. And that's really not what we need. 
What I would like to see Boeing do is to send a clear message to their employees and the public that they really will prioritize safety over delivery schedules going forward. I would like to hear Boeing announce that anyone who stops the production line after identifying a safety risk would get rewarded with a substantial bonus if their concerns leads to the discovery of a genuine issue, and with absolutely no penalty if they were honestly wrong. Of course, I understand that if you implement this, the production line might stop every three minutes or so when it's first implemented, but gradually the production will then stabilize at a level where people can do their job safely and where there genuinely should be less issues in total. The fact is that questioning even dissenting opinions from your workforce should be the norm if you hope to catch problems before they become almost insurmountable. And publicly celebrating those who did the right thing by pointing out a problem will encourage others to do the same. Now, I understand that this will likely take years. Boeing didn't get into this position overnight, as I explained in my recent Boeing series, but just as people immediately saw a change for the worse after the merger with McDonnell Douglas, a change in the right direction could incentivize people positively just as fast, and I really hope it will. What do you think? What changes do you think Boeing should make? Let me know in the comments below. Now, Watch these videos next and consider supporting me and the channel by joining my fantastic Patreon crew and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye bye.